Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to e-commerce conversations, a podcast by Practical E-commerce. What is going on, Internet? Eric Reynolds back again with another amazing episode from e-commerce conversations. Hope all is going well on the other side of the internet. On the other side of the table from me, longtime friend Dean with Manflow Yoga. Welcome, man. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me again. Well, yeah. Not back on the podcast, but yeah, in person. In the Beard Brand studio. Well, for those who don't know, we go back probably to 2015, I would imagine. Yeah. Where we both were in a uh, office, a B-class office mm -hmm. in uh, Westlake, which yep. was uh, many years ago. And we were both doing YouTube at the time. Yes. So yeah. we just kind of connected from there. And you were upstairs, we were downstairs. Yeah. That was my first office. Yeah. I moved in. I think I got a bunch of uh, just used. I didn't even for it. I had some old office equipment from one of my clients. Long story short, we're clearing out this other place, just go in and grab some tables and some stuff. So we had like two tables in there. I think we set up some mats on the ground, but we were recording videos and, you know, an office studio. And we, hopefully people didn't notice that it was just like a, you know, a beat up office studio. But yeah, that was my first office place. So that was a big milestone for me. I remember my then girlfriend posted about it. She's like, first office, big deal. That was our second office for us. Okay. But uh, our first one was kind of like a quasi house kind mm. of condo kind of thing. That's got a nice startup feel though. Yeah. It was actually like we lived in a, a duplex and okay. the bottom floor is where we lived and upstairs was the Beard Brain office, Oh, which okay. is great because at night you didn't have anyone up there stomping yeah. around. And then True. That's we a good kind point. of outgrew that. And Westlake was a terrible decision for us. I just, oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, I live I lived in Mueller at the time. So it was just like a oh. 40 or 50 minute commute. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's no good. Yeah. Going east to west and west to east mm -mm. is not good. So if you're ever in Austin, don't go east to west. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be in the neighborhood. Yeah. And uh, don't run an office in Westlake, apparently. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. You got out of there, too, huh? Yeah, it was a short-term deal. It was like eight months. Yeah, and then we found this other place off of 35, which was like this, also this rundown building. And we had the office right on the inside of the back door. So like we had to put signs on the door that said, recording, don't walk in. Because people just walk into oh, offices. Yeah. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. They yeah. just walk in. They're like, hey, I'm selling phone. I'm like, get out. <laughs> what <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> we did a collaboration before COVID. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't know. Did that make it up to YouTube? Made it on ours. I know, uh, and this is like the main complaint of my audience is that I take a 10 minute video and it's like 27 minutes. So I think that's what happened with ours too. So I don't know what you were able to do with that 10 minute workout that turned into like a 30 minute tutorial. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see me doing some awkward yoga. You did, you did good for a tall guy, especially. Yeah. That's a lot harder on you. Well, I want to kind of go back to the early days and your mm -hmm. business model and kind of talk about what your business model has been and how it's yeah. like kind of evolved over the years because you're from what I remember wasn't it like essentially like sending DVDs in the mail or yeah so the first thing I sold was t-shirts and I had a YouTube channel I had a Facebook page I had the Facebook page to tell people about the YouTube channel and yeah I sold I think the first product I sold was t-shirts and then from there I started selling like one-off programs so like you know a program with four workouts that I would sell for 20 bucks or something and then I did ebooks on Amazon and sold those off my website. Early on, I partnered with a DVD company called, or the brand was called Body by Yoga. And that was a great decision because they had, the guy who organized it, the producer, had the experience working with DVDs in the past and the ability to understand how to make a product successful on Amazon. So he did all of that stuff. I kind of just created the product. My audience helped to make those DVDs successful on Amazon, got reviews, and those DVDs still do really well. They're still in like the, I want to say in the top 50, there's three in the top 50 of exercise and fitness on Amazon. Two of them consistently get in the top 10. And 
the plan overall was just to get, and the DVDs were just one example of this, and the eBooks were another, but the plan was just to get as much different content as I could out there so that people would say, who's Dean Pullman? What's Manful Yoga? And then eventually we figured out, and kind of funny that we figured it out. It took so long, but we were putting out this content, teaching people how to do yoga and how to do yoga workouts. But we were putting out minimal yoga workouts. We were putting out lots of tutorials and stuff and saying like, hey, here's how you can make down dog better. But we weren't actually putting out workouts. So then in 2016, we launched a members area with streaming videos, like an on-demand Netflix type deal for workouts. And when I got my first yearly recurring subscription from that, and nobody called the next day saying, I want my money back. I was like, okay, this is, this is like, this is a business now. This is yeah. actually going to work. And so, you know, but I was also doing a lot of other things. I was doing classes at Silker Park, you know, in person. I was doing a lot of private lessons. I did classes at gyms. So I was just really spread out. I was just talking about you earlier before we started the podcast, but I was doing a ton of different things and really spread out. And it felt weird to be putting out content on Instagram saying, hey, I've got a live in-person class at a, you know, group class at this gym. And someone from Florida is like, oh, I can't make it. And then <laughs> I have to reply to them and say, oh, but I have a YouTube channel. And so eventually it just got to the point where I was like, you know what? If you want to work out with me, it's all in my app in my members area. Yeah. yeah so just simplify it. Yeah. Walk me through that decision process, because I think one of the challenges a lot of entrepreneurs have is you see the opportunity in everything. Mm hmm. You know, sometimes those in-person classes are kind of like easy wins. They're easy ways to generate revenue and, and almost kind of necessary to put food on the table. So, you know, when did you kind of cut that cord and walk me through like when you knew it was the right decision? Hmm. So my plan when I first started teaching in-person classes and privates, the goal the way that I envisioned myself and how I was going to be putting out content with Manful Yoga and just in general where I wanted to be one day. And now that I'm here, I don't really know what I want to go from here. But the plan was always to create a small team of people and to be an online yoga instructor. So I was doing all of these other things to kind of support that, to support the creation of the online yoga teaching and the online fitness you know, kind of website. And I think I don't quite remember when exactly I had to stop doing the in-person stuff and if there was a conscious decision involved or not. I think I just realized that unless I was really going to commit to doing in-person things consistently, 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 it just wasn't going to grow the way that I wanted to. Because if you're trying to make a successful in-person fitness class, you have to have a predictable time and location. It has to be every Monday at 6 p.m. And then after you do that for like six months and people are like, oh yeah, Dean has that class at 6 p.m. at this gym, then it'll really start to grow. But I never could stick with something consistently for months and months and months. So I would have maybe two months. We had a Saturday class at 1 p.m. or something like that. But I also didn't have my own space. So I was doing it at other gyms. And I think from a branding, just from a consumer perspective, looking at it, like, why is Dean teaching here? Is this a yoga class meant for these types of people? And so it never really just did as well as I really wanted it to with the audience. So it just didn't grow. I wasn't getting enough people in classes. So I think I just realized that, okay, you know what? The online thing is working. I could do this, but it's really not that fulfilling to do a group class and have like two people show up, mm -hmm. you know, or like one person show up. So eventually I was just like, you know, this isn't fun. I don't, I don't really want to keep doing this and keep trying to spend time marketing it because you have to market in-person stuff just as much as you would for, you know, an online thing. Yeah. So like I'm spending, you know, I'm making like three or five posts a week or something or sending out email blasts for an in-person class that brings five people and I make 15 bucks a person, that's $75. This isn't a great use of my time. So I think it's just like the scalability of online is just so much oh, higher yeah. too. Like you said, the most you could ever get in a classroom is probably what, like 20 people Yeah, in a fairly large location. But right. online, it's hundreds or thousands of people mm -hmm. around the world you can yeah. really pull in. The other part of that was also, I love the idea of creating something and then it being there forever. Yeah. Like putting a lot of effort in creating a video and then saying, okay, great, that's done. Let's put it out. And then it being there forever. And someone asked me 
Dean, do you have something that does this? I'm like, I do. I spent a <laughs> lot of time and effort on it. It's right here. Here's a link. You can go view it anytime you want. You can't do that with a in-person, you know, class or group class. So that was another factor. And I'm also just not a huge people person. Took me a while to figure that out. Yeah. But I can spend about two hours a day having conversations with people. And then I'm just like, it just, it's tough for me. I don't know why, but it just makes me really tired. <laughs> it's the classic introvert. Yeah. So the online thing just made a lot more sense than, you know, trying to crank out six or eight. I mean, I was doing for a while, I was doing six, eight, even 10. I think at one point I did 12 classes in one day or oh, something. Wow. And I have no idea how I kept doing that. But yeah, this creating content is just, and, and having something live forever, that just made a lot more sense with who I am. Obviously, being in the fitness area and kind of like fitness from home area, COVID was a, I would imagine, a, a giant boom for business. Yeah, it was. Walk me through like, how were you still trying to get out in front of your target audience and kind of bring them in? Was it still through organic content, like your YouTube channel, driving people in? Or did you kind of endeavor into any new acquisition channels for your marketing? The one thing we did was created a landing page called Free Yoga Workout. It was just free yoga workouts for men, I think like that. And we directed a lot of Facebook and Instagram traffic that way. So we just created an ad. And part of it was, you know, a genuine heartfelt, hey, you know what? This is really messed up and we're not going to be able to work out. So I have a bunch of free workouts. I created this page for you if you want to go check it out and use these instead of your normal yoga classes. And, you know, if you just so happen to really like it and you want to sign up and get access to all my stuff, then great. But, hey, here's a free page with a bunch of my yoga workouts. Enjoy. So that was the one thing we really did differently. We already had, you know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I think even at that point, maybe 80%, definitely over 60% were finding us through organic search. People searching for things on YouTube, people searching for different variations of yoga for men on Google. So we did that free yoga workouts thing. We finally started doing more of a paid funnel system before we kind of just had our free, you know, our, our just organic lead magnet set up. And that was doing well, getting people over from YouTube and Facebook and trying out like a seven day challenge or something like that. But we finally started a paid funnel that was working where we would do a six week challenge for nine dollars. And then after that, we would, you know, sell them into the full members area. And that converted at 20 percent. So anybody who signed up for a $9 challenge, one of five of those people ended up coming into our members area, which is pretty good. And we also did an upsell within that challenge for download access, and that was $50. So instead of just $9. So because of that upsell, and I think one in six people did that upsell, that really minimized the cost of acquiring those people. And I think it cost 15 to $20 to get somebody to sign up. So that was really cool because that was the first time that we had like a lead magnet set up or a paid lead magnet set up that was consistently converting people. And we knew that if we put in X dollars that like seven weeks later, we would get back. Yeah. And also in the pandemic, people were, especially when it first started off, people were really signing up very quickly for something because they weren't sure. It was almost like, like this scarcity mindset of, I don't know where my next workout's going to come from. It's not really something that you hear people think about, but it was a major concern. I was even making content based on yoga is going to burn less calories and f who knows what food we'll be able to, <laughs> yeah. who knows what food we'll be able to buy. So yeah, a lot of people were just signing up because they were like, I don't know where I'm going to get my next workout. So I think our conversion rates like doubled during that time. So yeah. And what a great, I mean, what a great business too, because you know, you need a yoga mat, right? Right. And yeah. a TV and. Exactly. You've got a, like maybe a block, like mm -hmm. a cork block or, or whatever that is. Yeah. And I was also trying to convince people because a lot of people didn't have, you know, most people don't have weights at home. I think many more people now have weights at home than the start of the pandemic. But at that time, I was talking to people about the importance of mobility and, hey, look, this isn't a terrible thing. If you take off weightlifting for two months, but you focus on your mobility instead, and then you go back into weightlifting you're going to be so much better off because most people are just, you know, they're addicted to the feeling of progress with yeah. weight training. And it's so hard to see progress in weight training if you take like a week off. So people are really scared of missing their workouts. So it was a lot of what I was trying to convey was, hey, you're really not missing out on that much 
if you, you know, take some time working on your mobility, doing the kind of stuff that we do, then you're only going to greatly increase your overall potential strength with weight training. So that was another message that I was trying to put out during that time. Yeah. And you personally, you do both. Like you're, yeah. you're into both. Yeah. I think what was interesting when we were chatting the other weekend was how men actually do yoga differently than women. Yeah. Like I, it never occurred to me that mm-hmm. there would be kind of like, just like that different. Yeah. I mean, they're just men and women have different bodies. And it's interesting because I'm reading more and more about on social media, there's a lot of trending toward, you know, discussions about gender equality and how that's being misconstrued as physical equality in the sense that men and women are the same and you're not. And, you know, there are differences. Like Men are going to use their upper bodies more. Women tend to use their hips and their core more. Women are more flexible hips in particular. So if you ask someone new to yoga, a man or a woman who's new to yoga to do a certain pose, they're most likely going to look pretty different in it. So speaking to common errors that men will have as you're teaching and having modifications for poses that men would find difficult is really important for making, not only just because it's helpful for your body and you're going to better work out and avoid injury, But also because if you teach yoga to a man the same way you would teach it to a new woman is that you're creating this feeling of incompetence in a man if you're asking him to, okay, just bend over, touch your toes. And the guy's like struggling to touch his knees and you're like, oh, come on, do it. Just, you know, and, you know, so there's that difference and you want to create some confidence and you want something that like a guy can actually do. So I also have right in front of me is this beautiful book. Thank you which to me, looking through this, has to be like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. Like, yeah, you've done eBooks before. Is this like a conversion of one of your eBooks or? This is a completely different piece of content that I've created. My first book was an eBook called Yoga Basics for Men. The second book, which was published by DK, was Yoga Fitness for Men which was largely based on yoga basics for men, but really taken up a few levels in terms of the production level and just the professionalism behind it and the amount of thought that went into it. And those books were more focused on, this is yoga. This is how it might make more sense for a guy. Here are some ways that it can make you stronger. Here are some common misconceptions about it. Here are the poses. Now that you've worn the poses, here are some workouts you can put together. And here are three programs that I put together that you can follow. This book is written specifically. So this book is Yoga for Athletes. And the whole focus of this book is teaching athletes how they can improve their performance with yoga. So without dramatically changing their training schedules, without asking them to really change much of what they do at all, this book is focused on 10 minutes of yoga per day to help you improve your performance. So it starts off with typical problems that athletes experience. So we go through things like Achilles tendonitis, shoulder problems. We talk about runner's knee, low back pain. So we go through all these common ailments or common injuries and common pain points that athletes have. And then from there we go into here is how yoga can help. So we go into specific yoga poses that will help and then also specific yoga workouts that will help. So it's much more of a hey, athletes, if you want to get better, here's what you do. Instead of saying, I think the general message with yoga has been, hey, athletes, guys, come do this yoga class. It's going to be great for you. And the athletes are like, why? And they're like, I don't know. But if you do this 60-minute yoga class, it's going to help you get better. And you don't need to do a 60-minute yoga class to get better as an athlete. You know, because they're already getting a lot of fitness from their other workouts. They don't need to do a yoga workout focused on endurance because they're doing a lot of endurance. So this book is really focused on filling the gaps of an existing training program of an athlete instead of doing a lot of overlap. So how do you get in contact with DK? Like walk me through like kind of the business strategy for this book. Is this going to be like a customer acquisition for you? Is this just another product to sell? Mm -hmm. Is this like a lead magnet or is it just a way to kind of like build authority for, you know, your brand, what you're doing? It is everything that you just said except for making money <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's really a, it's authority also personally i love books so you know the ability to write a book and have it published was something that was really cool for me but dk publishers reached out to me in 2016 and i just kind of jumped on the opportunity i think they were talking with a couple of other youtube male instructors and 
there either wasn't a lot of interest for them or they weren't really focusing on you know, what they wanted to put out. And this for them was they wanted to do a non-spiritual fitness approach for men. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I do. That's my whole shtick. So they reached out to me. I jumped at it. I said, yeah, let's do it. And then I really took control of the content creation process. Like instead of them coming to me and saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. I came to them and I said, look, here's what we should do with this. Let's answer these questions. Let's really think about who this book is going to help and what the mission of this book is. I actually used Ryan Holiday's book, The Perennial Seller. The Daily Stoic or? Yeah, yeah. The same guy who does The Daily Stoic. Yeah. Um, and I, I loved his books anyways. But he he came out with a book called The Perennial Seller. Okay. That was all about how do you create content that lasts? Because you're not only competing with content that's coming out today. You're also right. competing with something that came out 60 years ago. So I used a lot of inspiration, a lot of content from that book. But the whole focus of Yoga Fitness Room was really creating how do we make something that's going to last for years and years and years and really deliver value. So. It wasn't just, let's write a lot of stuff about yoga fitness for men. It was, okay, what's the vision of this book? How are we going to deliver that? So there's a lot of, not just content creation that went in the book, but really answering those questions of what are the goals of this book and how's the best way to do it? That's how I worked into that. And then to make yoga for athletes, I reached back out to them and said, hey, you guys want to do another book? Because as far as I can tell, my book is doing pretty well compared to a lot of the books that you put out. And they said yes. So did the same process. Uh, think, okay, how is this really going to help athletes? How is it really going to stick out to athletes? And what are the main reasons why athletes aren't doing yoga? And so that's why we, we really condensed it. And not condensed it, but we really simplified it to, okay, let's, what if you just had 10 minutes a day? Can we make you stronger? And the answer is yes. And so we try to make it as easy to digest for an athlete as possible. I'm curious, you know, what does a deal look like? Are they just paying for the rights and then they own the book and then they make all the money or is there a royalty in it or are they paying you to kind of produce it? Like there's tons of photography in here. You've got models in here. Like, you know, of course the book is laid out beautifully. Like how much of that is you, you know, organizing and doing and how much is it them, you know, kind of lining up the photographer mm-hmm. person? Yeah, so they do the design. They largely create the order of the book and the layout of the book and kind of the overall flow of the book. But it's based on you giving them what you want to do and your overall content. So the first book, I really took charge of Yoga Fitness for Men and I kind of really strongly led the creation of that book. This book, I did as well, but not as much. So this book, I really worked on compiling as much as I could and then giving it to them and then kind of saying, okay, so this is what I think, but what do you guys think in terms of how this should be organized? But the artwork, the photography, choosing the photography, choosing the location of the photo shoots, that stuff is all done by them. So I'm mostly focused on the writing, figuring out what poses are we going to use, writing the, the routines. So all the written stuff is me, but the artwork is mostly them. Yeah. And then as far as the way that the payment is structured, there's an advanced royalties payment. So they pay you whatever, a few thousand dollars every time you hit a certain milestone on the book. But you don't, you know, they're not paying you that money in addition to the royalties. Right. So like after a couple of years, then you'll start to make money once you've paid back the, you know, the advanced royalties. Their investment. Yeah. And then they do all the distribution. They mm-hmm. sell it on Amazon. Yeah. They sell it in bookstores and, and right. stuff like that. And they do a lot of the PR too. So last time I put out the book, I had interviews with the Chicago Sun. It was featured in Men's Health. It was in a men's fitness magazine. Yeah. So they do a lot of the PR stuff behind it. Yeah. So they take a lot of you know the work for you, which that, is really nice. Yeah. That PR aspect of it seems like it would be you know worth it alone because i assume you're you're going to be driving links back to your website and mm-hmm. and then of course going on the podcast circuit and yeah I, I probably should do more podcasting yeah are you launching your own yes i haven't announced that publicly i, I don't know how many people will will hear this or not <laughs> but yeah i'm i'm working on getting all of that set up and getting the vision of the podcast down which i have so yeah i'm pretty excited for that just because it's going to be something new and an opportunity to talk about new things in a different way. Yeah. What I love about you, Dean, is like, I think you understand business from the perspective that you start with a content and there's so much power in that content. You know, a lot of 
e-commerce entrepreneurs get wrapped up in, you know, how do I sell more products? How do I sell more products Mm. versus thinking about how do I deliver more value? How do I bring value to my audience? And a lot of the way you do that online is through content. Mm -hmm. And then you've like broken the chains where you've got video, you've got books, you've got, you know, hopefully we'll hear uh, in the future, some podcasts from you, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like becoming a content machine and using that as a leverage point towards kind of really the foundation for building your business and growing. Yeah. So I get wrapped up in this entrepreneur's qualm, we'll call it as well. But, you know, the temptation is to go out and and say like, okay, how much is this going to cost? You you know, what's the sales page going to look like? What's all this going to look like? And I always have to stop myself. And usually what I'll write out and start like brainstorming is why the hell would anybody buy this? You know, like you have to be able to answer that question first. And then I come at it from the customer's perspective and try to make it as comprehensive as possible. Part of that is because I want to make sure that the customer understands, you know, if they have like a a question, I want that question answered within the content. So I want to make sure that what I put out is going to answer as many of their questions as possible, partly because that's what I would want, but also because selfishly, I just don't like answering questions over and over again. So I want to bake the answers into the content and make it as comprehensive as possible and lay it out step by step so there are minimal questions. But yeah, I think the most important part of creating the content is really figuring out what is the vision. And that's sometimes harder to answer. And if someone asks you, what is this about? And it takes you like three minutes to explain, then you need to get more clear on it. Like you need to be able to clearly say what the vision is for that product within a couple sentences or the idea needs to be refined more. Yeah. Where can people follow you? Where can they start integrating yoga into their lives? Where can they reach out to you? We have a great seven day challenge for men, specifically made for guys who are new to yoga, who are curious about getting the benefits and inserting it into their lives in a way that's practical on our website through YouTube at manfulyoga.com slash seven DC. That's our beginner's yoga for men challenge. That's a really great way to start it. 15 minutes per day, daily emails to hold you accountable. You you said seven DC, like dog, cat? Yes. Okay. The number seven. And then yes, D as in dog and C as in cat. Seven day challenge. Okay. Short. But yeah, that's a really easy way to get started. And then our uh, social media is YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I'm not cool. I'm not on TikTok. Not on Twitter? I'm not on Twitter either. I don't have a lot to say in 140 characters. I, I really put out long form content. Like right. five minutes is the minimum that I can get on a camera and talk uh, with, with being able to convey something important, I find. So yeah, not on Twitter. Okay, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe when I figure out how to do things yeah. with less characters, fewer characters, I can do that. There you go. Guys, go ahead and check out what Dean is doing. I appreciate you swinging by the studio and sharing some of your wisdom and mm-hmm. sharing some of your uh, tips for success. I'm excited to see uh, your podcast launch and take off. And thanks again for everything. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the chat. This has been another e-commerce conversations. Hope you guys learned a nugget or two. Thanks for listening. Cheers. And keep on growing.